The Disney Channel original movie Descendants premiered in 2015 as the network's way of cashing in on the young adult novel craze of the time. Sort of stepping into the ring as a Mickey Mouseified version of franchises like The Hunger Games, Divergent, Model Land by Tyra Banks, and those books that Kylie and Kendall Jenner pretended to write. Actually, Descendants manages to capitalize on pretty much every pop culture trend of the mid-10s, from fantasy kingdoms and dystopian anti-heroes to Dubstep and Dove Cameron, who, by the way, plays our leading Katniss-type character, who ends up at Aradon Prep School, alongside every legendary Disney character that they could shoehorn into this story concept, which would feel more clever if Disney Channel weren't acting like this was the most genius idea to occur since E equals MC square. Congrats, Disney. You learned about meta storytelling literally one year before it started to feel dated. So today, we're diving into the first movie in the Descendants series, an edgy new genre that still features an acapella show choir, plus a slew of anti-trope tropes that don't break but do slightly alter the mold when it comes to YA adventures. For example, behold this Mackenzian interpretation of the dystopian future, which obviously means layer upon layers of solid colored sweatshirts and an assortment of store-bought long sleeves and then take in the most iconic animated Disney villains brought to live action in a way you've never cared to see them before. And the screenwriting that's almost as bad as the songwriting that's only being used to accessorize the sporty spice choreography of Disney's directorial darling Kenny Ortega. So get into main character mode because you were born special. When you step into the shoes of Mal and and her even more maladjusted friend group. In today's Orange You Glad, it wasn't an origin story installment of Clip Breakdown. Watch. Hello television viewers, my name is Nick. Thank you so much for joining me once again on my channel for another installment of Clip Breakdown. This is the playlist where we dive into our favorite movies, TV movies, and other such content here on the web, and we break it down like the bullies and the popular kids at the new school where magic isn't allowed even though it's a magical school. That way we can look at each individual clip, each individual segment, and decide is this worthy of the goddesses of Jasmine and Aladdin, or is it the devil? such as, who is the bad guy in Robin Hood? Capitalism? Okay, yeah, f capitalism. By the way, I've added one new light to this setup today. This is what it does. It's subtle, but I like the difference. Anyway, before we get started, make sure you give this video a big thumbs up. That way you never miss new videos from me. I've got merch. I've got a Patreon. You've got a mail when we uh, you talk about The Descendants, which opens with the voiceover of Dove Cameron. I think she's an iconic Gen Z celebrity type. I think they, they even say like bad things about her on Tumblr or <laughs> Tumblr. I literally transported back to 2015 when watching this. Reddit, they say things about her controversies on line, but I just think she's like a, adorable. She's so gorgeous and a great actress. I thought she brings it in this movie. She's really like selling the character of Mal more so than her wig is doing, but we'll get there. Anyway, we start with her voiceover. What is it with the main actress in a movie doing a voiceover and sounding like a completely different person in the voiceover? You're like, who is that talking? Is it because like the acoustics are different in a recording booth or do they just like hire a voice double to be like, we don't know what you're gonna say yet. So just go, go to Barbados or whatever rich people do. Anyway, Mal, our main character is like, I live on the lost island here in a or Auradon with my parents. My mom is Maleficent and we don't have Wi-Fi. We don't have anything. We just live in the slums, basically. I was like, oh, shit. Disney is getting into the weeds here and making a commentary about classism and politics. And I would imagine it's like also a take on World War II with the invention of the ghettos being used to suppress the Jewish communities within large cities. Believe me, we're not gonna touch a single hair on that head. I just thought I would bring it up at the top to really, really darken it up for you. Just like this blue eyeshadow, baby. We go first over to the proper land of Oradon. The people on Mal's Island are separated by a 
magic force field, so we don't have to worry about them. They're a penal colony like Australia. However, Ben, our main love interest for the movie, he's the son of Belle and Beast, of Beauty and the Beast. And they're the, for some reason, kings and queens of this kingdom. I don't know what makes Belle and Beast superior to the others. Maybe that was like the most recent movie to come out out of all of the five main kids in this, but either way. Ben is about to be coronated as king, because I guess that beast has become impotent, and he's already come up with his first proclamation. I've chosen my first official proclamation. I've decided that the children on the Isle of the Lost be given a chance. The children of our sworn enemies. Who are their parents? Cruella Deville, Jafar, Evil Queen, and Maleficent. Good God, are you telling me that Evil Queen is her government name? I thought it was just a short descriptor, and also the nickname that those kids gave me when I was driving an ice cream truck that one summer. No, we don't have any more Powerpuff Girls Sherbert bars because I opened them all up and sucked out their gumball eyes out of jealousy. Now that I've absorbed their beady blue peepers, I'll be the most alluring cartoon character on this truck. <laughs> With some initial hesitation, Belle and Beast, whose crown is too big for his head in this, like, are you floating? They're like, I don't know, son, but you always see the good in people, and that's why we're gonna let you do it. I'm like, you know what? The royalty is a f***ing scam. Get it out. Abolish all government. It should be the purge, 24-7, 365 days a year. That way I could stop answering my emails. One thing to know that you may not have known is that Descendants is a musical, and it's been led by the best. Since Disney Channel had already established both High School Musical and Camp Rock as successful franchises, Descendants was not just aiming to replicate that formula. They were trying to optimize it for even bigger runaway record sales. And so throughout the movie, you'll notice they heavily incorporate the sounds and popular styles of music from the time of 2015. For example, the ear-splitting elements of dubstep and misused moments of hip-hop that you'll hear in the very first song from the soundtrack. Along with one other frequently used trope from pop music, lyrics that don't make sense or just kind of suck when you think about them linguistically. They say I'm bad, they say I'm evil, and that makes me glad. Dirty no good, down to the bone, your worst nightmare can't take me home. I don't get it. How and why would my nightmare take you home? Is my nightmare trying to f you? Well then, it's very wise of you to play hard to get. And anybody who's experienced nightmare d will agree with me. That's when it engorges to become a barbed corkscrew shape and latches onto the inside of your walls. Think the genitals of a pig combined with the genitals of a cat. I said think of it, and also mentally visualize it. Imagine the nightmare genital combination I've just described and then tell me you still believe in God. I'm not gonna lie, there is some good singing in this movie, even though it was not even originally envisioned as a musical until Kenny Ortega became attached, who famously directed movies like High School Musical, he directed Hocus Pocus, Camp Rock, I think, no, not Camp Rock, f it, I don't know, look it up. In any case, this opening number, which had the potential to be my favorite song on the soundtrack, features the main cast basically talking their way through the song with all of the crunchy rasp and sass that the musical director could shake out of them. Dove Cameron is over here and she spray paints that live slash evil logo onto things, which I think is just an Easter egg for the novel series that was written to partner with this, and I, I couldn't say. It looks like a Disney Channel logo, so live as the same graphic designers. They say I'm trouble. Uh, they say I'm bad. Uh, they say I'm evil. Uh, and that makes me glad. Uh. Okay, well, you don't sound evil. You sound like the voiceover for a Yo Play yogurt commercial. Getting a full serving of calcium has never been so delicious. Yo Play, it's where the pets go. I don't like any of these lyrics that literally introduce the characters. Like, you couldn't have spent more than five seconds writing the rhyme that defines the people. Anyway, that's Dove Cameron. She plays Mal. She's the daughter of Maleficent the main, like, well, the antagonist from Sleeping Beauty, played famously by Angelina Jolie. Then you have Boo Boo Stewart playing Jay. He plays the son of Jafar, obviously from Aladdin. Next up, you'll meet Cameron Boyce, late Cameron Boyce, who really tragically passed away at, I believe, age 20 from a chronic illness, and it just, like, rocked young Hollywood and all of Hollywood, and he's, like, I'm not just saying this to pay reverence, but he is a great performer, and, I mean, he never had a problem carrying this character off. He's the son of Cruella de Vil, who, uh, because of parental abuse, he's like afraid of dogs, but also sometimes acts like a dog. And I'm like, are you all like an embodiment of the thing that your parents loved? Because then we have Sophia Carson playing Evie. She's the daughter of the evil queen from Snow White. Yeah, again, I didn't know that was her full f 
name, but Snow White's stepmother, the evil queen, she loved vanity. She had the magic mirror, she was jealous of Snow White. So Sophia Carson plays like a very self-involved person who just wants to look pretty, but also has a lot going on under the surface. Let's meet them. Oh, and speaking of, that raspy voice that we hear from the evil offspring is particularly noticeable coming from Cameron Boyce in the chorus of this song, Rotten to the Core. It sounds like he was essentially mixed up to be the lead vocals, which for me makes the melody feel a lot more like the exhausted grumblings of an overworked child actor. So I guess it's emotionally authentic. I'm rotten to the core, core, rotten to the core. I'm rotten to the core, core, who could ask for more? Yeah, don't worry about moving your mouth to the song lyrics, kids. Just do those dog with an ear infection dance steps that we taught you. Oh, and someone from the costume department is gonna come around and add even more layers of clothing to each of your little bodies. Ladies, if you're wearing pants without a skirt layered on top, you're front of the line. And I need all cast members to arrive wearing each of their three structured leather jackets with shoulder pads. Thank you. I'm not saying Cameron Boyce sounds like he's grumbling the rotten to the core core. It sounds normal if that was going to be the baseline of the whole track, but it's not really the most exciting thing to hear up top. Which leads me to believe that was the most exciting performance they got out of all of them in the booth. They even isolate him grumbling and use it as an audio transition throughout the rest of the movie. I'm rotten to the core. I still can't believe that Disney Channel wrote a song from the perspective of the mysterious growth where my ass used to be. They don't come right out and say that's who's singing the song, but it's meant to be an Easter egg for those who are intimately familiar with my ass. Also, I think it was too hard for them to rhyme anything with the original line, my antibiotic resistant infection, infection, my painful ass. As infection, infection. My voice has a lovely inflection. I came up with a rhyme, so I'm smarter than Disney. Do you ever spend too many hours in one day thinking about a certain topic, and then by the time bedtime rolls around, you're like, I can't brush my teeth anymore. That's how I'm starting to get with this. It's almost midnight, and I have to somehow feed myself a meal. Th to think of someone who could just go and boil water right now for that type of food intake, like, are you a, a miracle worker shaman? Not I. Feeding myself and cooking at home is one of my biggest challenges. If you tell me to go and chop a vegetable right now, I will tell you no, and I will sleep on the floor. And since I can only cook for myself under very specific circumstances, I am frequently, like for the last year or longer, reaching for meals in my fridge that are stocked by Factor. Factor, by the way, is a sponsor of today's video. Such a warm, fuzzy feeling when a brand that I love reaches out to me. Factor delivers fresh, never frozen meals, two minutes in the microwave and you're eating. These are dietitian approved meals with ingredients sourced with integrity. You can choose between four to 18 meals per week and easily add or reduce each week depending on how you're going with life. Also, you can easily skip a week if you need to. It's always exactly what I need sent to my door every week, which helps further reduce waste. And on top of me not having to go to the grocery store, which is, I just won't do it anymore, I promise. The fact that Factor meals are ready to eat so quickly makes it impossible for me to order takeout that night. I feel great knowing that they have registered dietitians in the kitchen working to make sure that the meals they send me are balanced and healthy. Oh, and I love the add-ons. You can get protein bites or delicious cheesecake that I had. Also, the smoothies are great. I feel a lot less guilty about editing and shooting my videos well into the night when I can still make time to have a good meal afterwards. I'm making the right life choices. Head to factor75.com or click the link below and use code NICTORAMIO50 to get 50% off your first Factor box. Again, that's 50% off your first box at factor75.com when you use the code NICTORAMIO50. Anyway, fun. We have a whole kind of rent, we're not gonna pay vibe here on the Lost Island. And then those four kids who we just got an intro from, who, as we heard, Ben is choosing as like the pilot students to come and be transferred over to the Aridon prep school. They're literally like the kids of the most prolific villains. And they're like, no, no, come on over. We don't have any intel on whether you're safe or planning anything. Go have your private conversation with your criminal parents, then come infiltrate our borders. So we get to meet the parents. Right off the bat, Mal's mom, Maleficent, played by Kristen Chenoweth, she wants the fairy godmother's wand. She's like, you're all gonna go to that school. Get me that wand, because I'm gonna take over this whole world. Break down that barrier and all. With that wand, I will be able to bend both good and evil to my will. Evie, you just find yourself a prince with a big <laughs> castle. Well, I see what you're saying, evil queen, AKA screen icon, Kathy Najimy. There's a lot more to look for in a potential partner than a huge castle. But I guess as an inmate living in exile, I can't blame the evil queen for feeling preoccupied 
preoccupied by the idea of a prince with such a impressively large southern tower. A silo so ginormous that it's almost intimidating. One that's rock hard with the texture of naturally formed stone bricks. Just a giant mass of craggly cobblestone with moss covering its northern surfaces. Whew. I'm sorry. It's getting a little warm in here. I'm gonna take a quick break just to cool off. Hey Siri, what does it mean if I'm sexually attracted to castles? Oops, still recording. Okay, we uh, Disney. Let's get back into it. I think we're back with the king and queen of Aradon, right? And they're both talking inside one of the sexiest f***ing castles I've ever seen. That's slang, because I love architecture, really good architecture. But first we have to meet Cruella de Vil, who I guess is like a supernatural villain in some way. This actor is Eartha kidding so hard that Eartha can't kit no more. They have dogs in Oradon. Oh, no, I'm not going. Oh. Well, Jay isn't going either. I need them to stock the shelves in my store. Okay, so Disney Channel decided to make Jafar their only villain of Middle Eastern descent into a convenience store owner with unscrupulous practices like Apu from The Simpsons. Real nice, Darsney Charsney. Well, I hope you recognize that by reducing Jafar to that racial stereotype, you're completely disregarding his life's work as an Arabian terrorist. Why not mention that he's also a radical dictator? Am I the only one who understands racism around here? So the kids are compelled to go along with this plan, even though at first like, I don't want to go to a land of prep school losers with rich kids with the nice parents who love them. Meanwhile, I can only imagine Kathy and Jimmy's neck sweat forming a real torrent under that cowl she has on. But the kids get whisked off to Arendelle outside of that secret little, I don't know, there's like a clicker where they get to go through the barrier I'm like, that's gonna come up later, but it doesn't. And the kids, you can tell that they come from a less privileged life because the boys are like, oh my God, this chocolate is so good. It's salty like nuts. I was like, you, you said what? They eat candy, they love it. They didn't have Wi-Fi before. They get to the school and they meet the fairy godmother who is the, the headmaster of the school and also the one that we need to steal that wand from, remember. We also meet the fairy godmother's like daughter. She's sweet, she's really pretty, but also Ben, who's the king to be and like, the coolest kid in school, obviously, who's giving them a tour, but not without the girlfriend. That's the fairy godmother's daughter, Jane? Jane or Audrey? They all look the same. All the girls in this look very similar. I think it's Jane. Either way, she has a bone to pick with Mal, obviously. If you can remember their history, which I could not, so I'm glad that they put it here. I totally do not blame you for your mother trying to kill my mom's sleeping beauty. No, and I totally do not blame your grandparents for inviting everyone in the whole world but my mother for their stupid Christmas. It was probably a good idea for them to include a verbal recap of the inciting incident from the 1959 animated Disney film Sleeping Beauty as it's sort of a crucial plot point to our understanding of Descendants. For me, it really helps alleviate the bad idea of making the inciting incident from the 1959 animated Disney film Sleeping Beauty into sort of a crucial plot point for the descendants. I don't know why Sleeping Beauty fell asleep and then when you tell me this fast, I wanna leave. I get that Darsney Charsney probably wrote the descendant franchise in order to tie together all of the stories from the Walt Disney Enchanted Forest cinematic universe. And don't get me wrong, it sounds like a great idea Idea to make a new IP out of the classic film legacy that Disney already owns the licensing to, obviously. It's new content that also breathes life into the animated icons from our childhood, like an inbred dog who won't stop barking at its own vomit stain on the carpet. That was a seamless simile. A lot of adults haven't seen movies like Snow White or Sleeping Beauty since they were in preschool. And I'm pretty sure many of the kids watching this in 2015 hadn't seen them at all yet. And that's why Descendants is genius. If there's one story aspect that every great screenplay has in common, it's a dependency on unnatural sounding expository dialogue used to illustrate a complex off-screen backstory that your grandparents saw in the movie theaters for a nickel. Speaking of, I wish I had a nickel for every clunky reference that a character in this movie makes while Disney bounding at prep school. As though everyone was just spewing out information freely about how their familial ties include them in this Charsney verse. Prince Charming Jr. Cinderella son. Look, I know your mom fell in love with a big nasty beast who turned out to be a prince. Grammy? Sleeping Beauty's mother. Hi guys, I'm Dopey's son. Hey guys, I'm Lonnie. 
My mom's Mulan. Hi guys, I'm Harold Hunchback, Quasimodo's butt boy. I just transferred here from Notre Dame after finally escaping the bell tower. In fact, I Mama. went, oh, that's probably him. Mama. He found me. <laughs> hey, Daddy Q, you big horny camel. I was just telling the kids at school about your twisted skeleton and how, oh, hi Esmeralda. No, bummer. Oh, okay. Quasi's back in the hospital. Turns out his back is like 85% malignant tumor, but don't worry, I'll be fine. Sully from Monsters Inc, you are up to bat. By the way, as I mentioned, Ben is the son of Belle and Beast. So he somehow genetically knows that it's better to see the good in people. In fact, it seems like every descendant kid is either focused in an unhealthy way on the achievements of their parents in their own standalone movie, or they have somehow adopted the same exact morals and motives. But as we just saw, those inherited character motivations are sometimes a little too subtle. So in order to explain it suddenly, it's it's like one of the characters starts reading the back of their DVD. Babe, I know that your dad is a clownfish and he's raising you by himself because a barracuda ate your mom and all of your sibling embryo. And at one point he had to look for you along with a neurodivergent other fish. But it's obvious you're addicted to sea anemone nemi. But anyway, I guess Ben trusts the villain kids because that was his parents' main movie message. Although I guess even that can get a little shaky. <laughs> My father wanted his statue to morph from beast to man to remind us that anything is possible. Okay, are you sure it isn't to remind everybody that they should value inward qualities more than superficial things? And that's just like the reason everybody loves your dad and refrains from making fun of how long his arms look on that statue. Anyway, Ben seems a little interested in Mal who is like, oh, this guy has a sense of humor about his status, just like me. The fairy godmother girl though, she's like, I'm gonna, no, that's not even the fairy. We don't know who this girlfriend's parents are. Nobody yet, we don't know. Sleeping Beauty, Sleeping Beauty, she says that, Sleeping Beauty. See, I mean, if this were in a book, maybe I would get it, but I don't know how to read. The kids get passed off to a nerd. He's the son of Dopey. He calls himself Dopey's son, and I was like, is he Japanese Dopey-san? But I just, I'm just a little too cultured for this movie, I guess. I make assumptions that are way beyond the intelligence of an average human. Anyway, that kid likes Evie, who's like kind of the superficial one, but she's got more going on than people would think. They hate the sunlight. They close the shades and they're playing like video games for the first time. But Mal is like, guys, we gotta break into that uh, like museum where the fairy godmother's wand is held because that's the whole reason we're here. They go into this dumb, very generic kind of 007 Mission Impossible parody style breaking into the museum thing. Oh, but at one point they come across the statues of all of their parents in like the hall of villains. And it shows their parents in their prime, even though it's like, they look the same just like in action. But all the kids are like, I can't believe my mom was that scary. And right before she leaves, Mal is feeling apparently conflicted about this whole thing when she either imagines or her magic conjures subconsciously or her mom is genuinely communicating with her through a statue using her magic. We don't know the cause of it. Kudos to the movie for letting me think for myself on this. But the Kristen Chenoweth statue comes alive and she sings a song that is the only one I remember ever from this movie. And it's like, don't you wanna be evil? It's a lot. It's long and it's showy. The daughter of an evil is just queen. Kristen Chenoweth is obviously a talented icon, and I think her casting as Maleficent is a genius choice. But I can't think of a single singer who could perform that particular number without causing my emotional state to start careening towards anger and annoyance. Like, ugh, mama, I was gonna snatch those plastic horns off your head in a minute, I'm just warning you. I do think it was smart direction to have Kristen go with a different character direction than the Maleficent that was in the recently released at the time, movie starring Angelina Jolie, cause she was like, I am the queen and I love the sleeping beauty. And it's like, okay, that would have felt like a parody <laughs> if they had copied that. Anyway, that little pep talk inspires Mal, real or imagined, to try and get the wand, but and Jay, the, the Jafar one, he's like, <laughs> I love stealing so much, I'm not gonna care about security systems. It's like, you would care even more. You would care even more about them. You're a criminal, hardened criminal, but they don't get the thing. They run off and they barely escape getting caught. Then the kids are in like Niceness 101, a class designed to teach them how to be nice, which I thought there was a funny moment where they're like given three right choices for like a moral conundrum and then one that's like, and then steal the candy from the baby. And they're like, just do the one that sounds least fun. I thought it was fun. Oh, and that's 
when the fairy godmother's daughter comes in. I think her name is Jane. And she's got this little bob, this artificial looking bob on, and she's like, I'm too nervous to talk to them. And the kids, the boys particularly, because you know, in Disney, we still love 1950s high school, where it's like, you got the captain of the cheer team, and then the football hunt heartthrob. And obviously Kenny Ortega's like, and that's the perfect setting for a Romeo and Juliet style romance. But the two boys are, are encouraged to take their aggression out at this like fictional Quidditch type sport called tournament. I guess that's a real sport in old timeies, but it looks like football here. Yeah, they're good at it though, what can I say? I can't explain it, but for whatever reason, this sequence that shows teen boys from a nepotism prep school playing rage lacrosse to a sick EDM beat drop has managed to perfectly encapsulate what American pop culture felt like in 2015. It, it was like this plus a Buzzfeed quiz. Regardless, these kids from the descendants of magical people may not be allowed to use magic, but they sure can celebrate their personal victories with visibly rehearsed stunt work. I love Darsni Charney for being like, what do cheerleaders wear to the big game? Oh yeah, loose fitting t-shirts with maybe a second t-shirt underneath, perfect. So Jay is like immediately brought onto the team. Carlos, who is played by Cameron Boyce, the Cruella character, is less quick to catch on to all of this. Mal realizes by talking to Ben that in order to get the magic wand next, she has to be invited to the coronation because she found out that's where the fairy godmother will have the wand outside of the museum. And the coronation for Ben is coming up soon and his girlfriend's gonna be sitting in the front row with him. So Mal basically has to steal Ben as her boyfriend from the other girl, dipshit. I think her name is. She also tries to bribe the Jane girl, who is the daughter of the fairy godmother, by fixing her hair and becoming friends with her. I knew the girl had shitty hair when we first saw it, but then she gets it changed into like curly, pretty locks like Mal has. And that girl is like, oh my God, how can I ever repay you? So like, she's making friends with the right people. Meanwhile, Evie has fallen in love with Prince Charming Jr., Cinderella's son, but he's like a jock. He doesn't care so much. So she's like cheating using her little mini magic mirror, which is basically a Palm Pilot to get the answers to science questions. Carlos, as we found out, has been made to be afraid of dogs because of Cruella who just hates dogs now that she can't wear their skins, I guess. But Ben is like, here's the campus mutt and now it's your dog. And Carlos is like, I love a dog. I guess you guys have it pretty rough on the island. Let's just say we don't get a lot of belly rubs. Good boy. I mean, you're a good runner, you're, you're, you're fast. See you later. See you out there. I know Disney would never admit this, but that was just a gay romance story that unfolded within seconds, even if it was just in subtext. Like, I know that's not what's happening between the characters, but if my gay 12-year-old brain had seen that when it came out, I would have immediately started daydreaming the boy-on-boy -boy subplot. Oh God. Anyway, I think this was queer coded so that the queer kids at home could feel like they weren't completely ignored by this movie with its otherwise diverse representation, which by the way, other than gay sh this movie does show different races, not so much body types, other than uh, they have a little person, they have someone in a wheelchair. You could see where they were headed with it, but this was well before the Disney Plus days of having kids come out to their parents on Good Luck Charlie. Evie has to dumb herself down to make Prince Charming Jr. like her, and he also makes her do her homework, so it's like, you're not being treated right here. And Sam, I think, the dopey son, he's like sad that she's doing all these chores, and that's when Lonnie comes in, and she's like, I saw what you did to Jane's hair. Can you do the same to me? I hate my hair. Now I'm cool. This movie definitely enforces the toxic standard that Western white people hair is more desirable and appealing. But just based on the imagery alone, it more so confirms to me that the difference in quality is very obvious when it comes to wig price points. Those two nerdy girls hair went from musical theater college to off-Broadway performance in a New York minute. Jay is quite an independent person because his dad always taught him like, the only way to get what you want is to make sure no one else has it. And I'm like, oh, that's how a sociopath 
is born. But the coach is like, no, a team is like a body. Everyone has an important part. I would be like, you said you want to explore my body? Just kidding, children. The kids are all kind of feeling conflicted about their whole part in this plan. But Ben comes over and is like, can you guys come to my coronation? And Mal is like, can we sit in the front row? And he's like, no, only my girlfriend can. And he's, she's like, okay, bye. And that's when they know they have to make a love potion. So that night they're in the kitchen doing that, making a love potion, which requires all these rare ingredients. And the last one they need is one tear of human sadness. That's when Lonnie comes in and she's like, oh, do you guys ever make cookies with your parents? And they're like, what? What is it? We haven't even had chocolate before this, dummy. It's called privilege. That That's what you have. Even villains love their kids. How awful. Yeah, well, <laughs> big bummer, but we have to get these into the oven. If someone stole my tear of sadness and then flicked it into their cookie batter, I would know for sure that they were going to murder me on that night, which is why I feel like this is the funniest scene in the whole movie to me. But it also manages to give us that character development where all of the villain kids start to question their parents' love for them. They're like, do our parents even love us or do they just care about this power? So I thought that was a nice deep moment. I do appreciate that this movie has an underlying message of like, not everybody's parents are perfect or great people, but that's okay. You can still be a good person. Trying to end the cycle of abuse, I think. But also classism, like not everybody has the same family as you. Some people come from vastly different backgrounds and you can't just tell them how to make their cookies. The next day they feed Ben the love potion cookie and he does start to fall for Mal right away. So their romance gets kicked off as far as she knows. And then Ben goes out on the field to play the tourney game with what's his name and what's his name. And he makes a like loving proclamation for Mal and breaks up with his girlfriend on the field after doing this song devoted to his love for her. I don't think the actors really knew the lyrics to these songs when they shot the scenes, or they're just trying really hard to nail the choreography, which is, you know, lots of Kenny Ortega trademarks, such as kids in athletic wear, kids with noodle legs, and kids with hoop arms. So anyway, he loves the girl. Oh, Prince Charming almost gets like uh, Evie in trouble by being like, she's using a magic mirror to cheat. But Sam saves her by being like, she can pass without it. She did so it's clearly not her. And because she believes in herself, she gets a B plus on it. So she's thanking Sam for reminding her to use her own brain for once. I don't love this dynamic. Either way, Mal, who has been giving beauty tips to the ugly girls, is also apparently the ugly girl because she's like the pick me of the pick me's. And Evie is like gonna do her makeup so that Ben really goes for her when they're on this date at the Enchanted Lake. My mom taught me how to apply blush before I could talk. My mom was never really big on makeup tips. Which is up because if the kids are acknowledging the existence of their own hair and makeup in this universe, then Mal's mom must spend two to three hours getting painted every morning to look like the Bride of Dracula. And yet she's stonewalling Mal on her trade secrets. That is evil. Mama Maleficent, you are in full Disney Parks face character day drag here. You can't spare one word of advice for your only daughter on how you keep that ivory Ben Nye cream foundation from cracking by midday. You don't have a word of wisdom on how to prevent it from trans transferring to your custom rigid necklace thing. I don't know what goes on. They go to nature, Mal and Ben. He swims in the lake. She eats strawberries for the first time and you know, she doesn't want to deceive him so much, but whatever she does. She sings a song that's basically like a recap of the whole movie and clips. I was like, okay, we're really in the third act now, aren't we mama? She thinks he's about to drown. So she saves him, but gets wet. And he's like, that's how I know you're a good person. You can't even swim and you still try to save me. And I was like, I don't even think I can swim and I'm going to jump off the side of this boat this movie doesn't end soon. The kids are able to have a meeting on Skype, magic Skype with their evil parents because it's parents day. And it just highlights for them how the parents are like, are you getting the wand? Where's the wand? You better be doing this or that. And it's like not about them at all. So basically Mal is completely conflicted about how her part in this whole plan. So she makes an antidote to the love potion, which the next day during the coronation for the wedding, she plans to give to him and set everything right. But that's not before we get this little number from the cool if you're stressed, it's fine dining, we suggest. Be our guest, be our guest. Oh yeah, another thing we all seem to love in 2015 was the movie Pitch Perfect. And that's why we're giving full Pentatonic's Christmas album realness right now. It's not my favorite, it's not my favorite song from this. Beast and Belle are apparently just hearing about Mal being his new girlfriend for the first time when Ben tells them. And they're like, oh, will you come play bocce ball with us even though you're evil? And she does, but then she meets this old woman who's like really pissed when she finds out Mal is the daughter of Maleficent. Cause it's like, that's Sleeping Beauty's mom. You put her daughter into an eternal sleep or your mom did. And I'm like, 
I don't understand anything about families anymore. What are we, what are we talking about? The poison apples and the spells. My daughter was raised by fairies. Grandma, we say that she was adopted by a same-sex couple. I'm so sorry about her. As you can see, her brain starts to go a little bit faster after that glass of wine. This basically causes a conflict and Evie is like, old lady, I think she kills the old lady with a gun. That's a lie, but they get in a fight. Prince Charming goes down. The kids are all basically shunned by the whole town. They're like, those evil kids are evil. And Ben is trying to be like, no, I'll fix this, I'll fix this. But then the evil kids are like, oh, we're being bullied now for being parents of evil. You you want evil? We'll give you evil. And they all walk into the commercial break like it's really cool, but it's really like Vancouver. Anyway, the parents are all watching the coronation at the evil castle and the kids are there and the mom, Christian Chenoweth, is like, come on, don't let me down, Mal. You're gonna sabotage this whole thing. And Mal is now like, oh yeah. But she's still gonna give the anti-love potion to Ben because she's like, if we're gonna destroy the barrier and let our evil parents loot the whole town and enslave all of our friends and family, it feels a little too cruel to have Ben still be in love with me the whole time. And it's like, oh, so she does have a heart. She's just kind of obligated to do this. Ben, however, right before eating the anti-love cookie, he's like, oh, I already know what this is, an anti-love thing. The spell washed off as soon as I jumped in the enchanted lake and you just did this because you liked me and you wanted to make sure I liked you back. And she was like, yeah, cool. So now Ben thinks he's like with Mal, but Mal is like, oh great, now Ben is on my side. He doesn't even know it. The kids, however, are kind of forgiven. They're like, the parents are like, we love you for trusting in goodness. Here's your crown that's too big. We're dressed sort of like the Beauty and the Beast. And right when the godmother's about to knight him with the wand, someone grabs a wand out of her hand. But it's not Mal like you would think, it's Jane, whose hair got turned back to straight and ugly. The mom is always trying to be like, inner beauty, inner beauty, inner beauty. But Jane loses it. She's like, I said I want straightened and a fucking Brazilian blowout hair, mother. I'm gonna stab you so hard with this stick. And Mal jumps into action. She tries to grab the wand to save the town because the barrier broke and Maleficent time jumps over to the island right away. She freezes everybody and she's like, I'm gonna steal your man and also just take over the world, I guess. Gaston should be jealous. Gaston is dead, you heartless wench. He fell off of a cliff during a rainstorm. Maleficent turns into that big lion dragon, dragon that I guess was in Beauty and the Beast. The way I did not see that movie when I had a fully developed brain makes this really hard to understand. But Mal with her eyes, so Maleficent can kind of like compel you to do things with her green eyes. Mal faces off with her dragon mother the same way, but it seems like her power and the power of good was strong enough to shrink the mom down into a little baby lizard size. So Mal wins, evil is dead. She shrank to the size of the love in her heart. Is she gonna be like that forever? You learn to love, so can she. Okay, great, so then let's get her into lizard therapy real quick and maybe she can be a human-sized lizard by Christmas. I love this for me. Neglected kids, now emancipated. Such fun. Mal and Ben kiss and Sam and Evie get together. She's not shallow because she likes some guy with glasses. Jay gets with the popular ex-girlfriend of Ben. You know, all the loose ends get really tied up. Oh, and Mal is like, I love my little lizard mom. Let's keep that open for the sequel. And they go into this big number. They're like, we're not what you think we are. He is smart and she plays guitar. It's like, all I see is a bunch of kids who had to and stay awake in the freezing cold all night <laughs> at a pseudo Disney castle. And then we hear the voice of Mal come back in. I was having so much fun, I almost forgot. You didn't think this was the end of the story, did you? She just decided to start stockpiling weapons. I smell a sequel. And it should be exciting because she has this crazy backlighting on her wig and this crazy look on her face that says Descendants 2 Senior Year Civil War is about to be completely unhinged. We're fighting Disney rebels. Pinocchio killed Jafar. I killed Scar. Goofy is bleeding. Wildcats killed the cat. Scar is dead and I'm the bat. <laughs> Sorry, I just joined rebel forces in my mind. I think you know I'm on the side of the Descendants when it comes to the evil versus good debate. What do you think of Descendants 1? Are you excited to get into this trilogy of films with me? Let me know in the comments below. Also give this video a big thumbs up if you wanna see even more clip breakdowns from me on DCOM, movies, and such. But most importantly, don't forget to click that subscribe button right over here. I know some of you watch without subscribing and that's perfectly allowed, but it's not my preferred mode of uh, transportation. 
Rachel. Anyway, I've also got merch and a Patreon where you can access watch parties, bonus episodes. You guys are all the greatest. Thank you so much for making it happen with me today on this franchisee installment of Clip Breakdown. You guys are all the greatest. I forget the words that I usually say. I will see you next time. Ah!